So welcome to This Cycling Live. Today I'm joined by Jeroen van Schelven, uh, who is a founder, entrepreneur, uh, creative genius, and owner uh, of Le Coffee Ride, which is a phenomenal little cafe and hotel in the iconic Ardennes region here in Belgium. So rather than me say too much more, Jeroen, maybe you could have a, give us a quick uh, intro to yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me, James. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeroen. I live in Belgium. I'm 34 today, and uh, yeah, I used to be a cyclist, uh, and today I, uh, I I run my own uh, company. It's called The Coffee Ride in the Ardennes, which is uh, an apparel brand with a yeah Ardennes base camp, cycling cafe, hotel, uh, more or less. Right. Well, happy birthday, you know. Uh, yeah. And as you know, it's my birthday on on uh, uh, Saturday, so we're we're very close together. Although I'm about. I guess, yeah, a few more years older than you. I turned, I just turned 50, but happy birthday to you. Um, and you're, you're being a little bit humble. I mean, you did write um, as, as at the Continental as, as a professional writer for some time. Um, mm -hmm. Can you maybe sort of start out by telling us, you know, what it was like growing up as a kid there in the Ardennes as, a, as, as someone with parents from Holland? And then where did your passion for cycling start to sort of uh, emerge? Yeah, so um, my parents moved to the Ardennes, uh, Belgium, when I was three years old. Uh, they moved out of the city of Rotterdam to uh, to you know look for some more green uh, environment, and uh, they had a job opportunity there in 1990. So we moved to Belgium, and um, yeah, it was special in a way that uh, we we had to learn uh, French speaking at school and Dutch at home, which was a, a great advantage growing up. And then uh, also like growing up in the outdoor sport environment. In that time, it was quite new, so they were doing all sorts of activities for tourists coming uh, to the Ardennes, and yeah, that was great because we we touched uh, based on a lot of sports, outdoor sports like paragliding, uh, like um, you know kayaking, hiking, uh, name it. I mean, mountain biking, obviously, and that's how I got in contact with with biking for sure. And yeah, I don't know, I got inspired by the time of Indurine. You know, I don't know. First time I remember watching a race on on TV, I was totally hooked. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And and how old were you when you got your first road bike, and then then started actually to to compete? Yeah, there was a, you know, a struggle because for some reason my dad, which he was actually right about, he, he didn't want me to start too early, so I had to wait till I was fourteen to get my first road bike. So before that, I was riding a mountain bike with slick tires, and uh, dressing like a road cyclist. But uh, I had to wait, so I started racing when I was fourteen. Great. And then uh, you, when you got into competition, did you uh, find it easy? I mean, did, did you have some natural talent or mm. were you someone who, who had to work hard? You know, one of the things I, I always joke with my kids, I always, I always tell my kids that, you know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. But mm. often as a teenager, you know, kids do have this natural talent and they can thrive. Where, where were you on that kind of spectrum? The natural ability or the hard worker? Yeah, actually a bit of both. So... When I was young, I was uh, already quite quite strong and uh, especially fast. So in the short races, uh, as a as a junior and before that, I always finished like top five, top ten, uh, quite quickly. So I was uh, I was quite strong, and I also managed to win races from the first year on. Mm. And then I won I won some um, some you know like championships, like Wallonia champion I, I became, and so on. So at the at the beginning, it was quite uh, promising, and you know it felt good, and then. Growing up, going to the under twenty three le uh, three level, I, I really had to start like working on my endurance and and looking more uh, after what I was eating and also you know making sure that I was fit to to climb. Um, so it, it actually became harder growing up uh, and had to do more for it, uh, which I did and and managed to to reach a certain level. So. Mm. And and you did have a I mean uh, of course you know also uh, I guess to put it in context. Um, you know, one of the things I've certainly witnessed um, having my own son, you know, who's done some competition here in Belgium is that, you know, as as a young young rider, you know, man or a woman uh, in that sort of junior or belofta uh, level, um, the level here in Belgium is incredibly high. So, you know, you're saying you're finishing top five or top ten in the Belgian uh, you know, the kind of environment um, obviously points points to some talent. And so you did then go on to race at the continental level. Uh, you did that for, I understand, what, three or four years? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So um, actually, from my from, from when I started, when I was 14, the ambition was directly to become like professional. And yeah. so I was totally hooked and obsessed by it. And 
from the first year on uh, I just did it super intense uh, and with yeah you know a lot of uh, a lot of energy put into the sport and um, then becoming on you know on a continental team was was great it was a uh, it was a, a satellite ti- satellite satellite team from uh, Lotto uh, the the world tour team so we had a good sponsor and they allowed us to participate at many pro races i think like 30 40% of our races were 1.1 races in Belgium, like the Tour of Belgium or the Europe Metropole Tour or Grand Prix de Wallonie, all these type of races, which allowed us at a young age to, you know, ride next to the, the big guys and get a lot of experience. So that was a great opportunity and a great experience. And um, yeah, it, it actually went off quite good from the start, but uh, I had some, I don't know, some some things along the way, which, um, yeah, made me stop at a young age. Yeah, but you did make that decision then to end your 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 cycling career, and and you didn't then move on into business. Um, how did that transition go? Because as I understand it, although you left the world of competitive cycling, you stayed very much in the world of cycling and and business. So how did your career then evolve when you made that shift from from being a cyclist into the business world? Yeah, actually quite good. Um, just for some reason, I I realized the the language. Uh, advantage I had speaking Dutch and French uh, fluently and also English and also having an experience uh, around cycling for a long time also worked uh, a few years part-time at Decathlon uh, in the bike area so I'd also already a retail experience there uh, about how how it works you know selling selling stuff and doing customer service and things like that and also did uh, like two years of a uh, marketing evening uh, studies so I had a good background to start and Knowing also like how it was to work in a store, I uh, had the idea. Okay, you know, I'm 23. I'm turning 24. I had I was looking for some independence, you know, uh, being on my own. And um, I thought, okay, I should try to find a job as a sales rep, uh, which has some good advantage to it. You know, you're you have some freedom. You're on the road, and um, so yeah, I, I started to write emails to many companies into cycling and uh, that's how I uh, came in contact with uh, Eddie Merck's brand and they hired me which was a yeah great great opportunity I I really started there with like uh, probably the smallest salary you could imagine I could earn more somewhere else but it was such a special name and company and brand that I thought hey that's a great opportunity so I, I give it a go yeah, yeah, and uh, you then went on. I mean, you worked for for, for a bunch of other companies in, in mostly, as I understand, in marketing and and sales related roles. Um, when then did you start to have this kind of inkling that you might want to step away from the corporate world and set yourself up as an entrepreneur? Hmm. Actually, um, pretty early on. <laughs> the one thing I remember is uh, I was uh, you know surfing the internet and I came across the you know the AliExpress or Alibaba website for the first time and. I was working at Animerx for one or two years, I think, and uh, a whole world opened up to me. Like I was like, "Whoa!" I saw saw all these frames and things coming from Asia. I saw some other brands as well popping up uh, with some cool, you know, entrepreneur stories slowly coming on. And I know, I don't know, like naturally, I uh, I had that that feeling that I wanted to create something, uh, but I was far away from anything really like happening seriously or. There were just yeah, just a lot of ideas, you know, and uh, yeah, it took took some time um, to actually start something. And what I experienced as well is that the longer I waited, the harder it became to make that leap, that jump. Because for some reason, when you work in a company, everything is sorted out for you. You you know, you, in my case, as a as a rep, I had a, a company car and you have your salary and everything. And then at some point, you build that up, and you're like, okay, how in the hell am I gonna? Uh, support myself financially uh, doing something my own so making that jump was quite a seemed like a huge step so, yeah. yeah and you then sort of started to I guess explore ideas and, and opportunities and and then uh, you eventually uh, acquired this incredible little hotel uh, and and uh, cafe um, in really the heart of, of what is, I guess, the heart of the Ardennes uh, cycling uh, in Belgium. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you made that decision and then identified this location uh, in, in Col, which is near to uh, Tropont? Did I say it right? Yeah, uh, in, in the south of Belgium. Yeah, so um, a few things together. Like I left uh, after five years the Eddie Merckx company uh, where I, I grew in the company quickly and 
started to do export sales and traveling and so on, which was a super experience. And then the company didn't went so well. So uh, I had to move somewhere else, which I did. And there I started to work uh, as a brand manager for very nice brands such as Giro and Look Bikes and, and Northwave and some other brands, which was interesting. The process as well, like uh, going from doing only mainly sales and a bit of marketing to uh, being responsible for a brand and, and all the organization and the supply and everything around it was really like uh, actually quite tough to do. And the most the hardest part, point was to be in the office. Uh, instead of being outside. So that was really a hard shift for me to, uh, you know, to accept that and to get through it. But at the end, I learned a lot and um, it was a great experience, but I, I didn't like it at all being, you know, inside. So that for sure, um, you know, reopened again the idea of, hey, I should, you know, do something of my own. I, I wasn't happy. So that really, I think, uh, was the the trigger to, to push me really towards making that jump at some point. And, uh, you know, I already was working on small projects uh, like at Eddie Merck with a Merck Psycho Club, which was inspired by Rafa. And yeah, I did already a lot of like small entrepreneurial little projects. So at some point, uh, it kind of all felt together um, to the opportunity to, to start something in co. Uh, my mother used to rent the place and uh, she was quitting her outdoor activity. So there was an opportunity to, to get that building and to, uh, you know, to start renting the building there and start a business and uh, that's actually I mean, just just a point on the uh, because and, and of course uh, I mean it, it, it's a beautiful location I mean that that corner location right there in Col, um yeah. really on on many <clears throat> really incredible um, cycling routes so did it take you a long time to identify the location and then um, in terms of then thinking through the the business model because what also strikes me you know having visited you uh, last last week um, is the way that actually you're combining these different aspects you've already been talking about into actually a physical location. I mean, your brand management, your apparel uh, comes together with the coffee and of course now the, the hotel side of it. So can you talk number one about how long did it take to identify that marvelous location? And then secondly, you know, how did the thinking about this sort of combined or hybrid business model start to, to emerge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the location was, um coming together at the, at the right time. And um, I'd really like a mix of ideas. I was writing down on paper, like a, how do you call it? Like a mind map uh, yeah. about all the ideas I wanted or had some, some good feeling around. And uh, for sure, podcasting was in it. Uh, apparel brand was in it. Uh, cycling cafe uh, was in it, all that, all, all those things. But um, yeah, and then, then the building was there and I felt like, hey, why not start here? And that kind of started like that. Uh, because my mom was, you know, had, having some problems there at the time. I mean, I was uh, having a hard time at the end. So, so there was an opportunity to 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 do something there, and that's how it actually uh, started. And later on, once I started, um, the other ideas of a podcast or or you know apparel brand and so on gently like came again on the radar. And once I started, uh, you know, doing the entrepreneurial journey. Um, yeah, one thing lead to the other, and um, that's actually how it grow. And for sure, I had a big advantage, like having quite some experience in in, in the industry of cycling related, like in bikes and apparel, and then also you know the, the how to how to organize supply and and contacts, and also like in general contacts in the bicycle world. Uh, also being active already on on social media, and then for sure like following like uh, a lot of content already at that time online about uh, business and just probably something I'm interested in naturally. So for sure, all these things together, um, yeah, make, make it makes makes it work. Yeah. 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 No, it's uh, th that for me was really, uh, I mean, one of the I, I, most attractive aspects of of what I experienced with with the coffee ride was the fact that, you know, you're able to really combine what you do in terms of the great coffee, um, obviously your hotel rooms, but also you mentioned the podcasts and the blogs and um, you know, I've been very impressed with the way you're doing that because, you know, for me visiting your site, I mean, if it was just a hotel site or just a cafe site, of course I would visit it, but maybe once <laughs> to see where you are and, and what your rates mm -hmm. are. Um, however, you know, that week where I was in the Ardennes, uh, I think I visited your, your site at least half a dozen times because actually I kept coming back for the content, yeah. you know, the mm -hmm. blog posts. Um, the podcast, which actually are really impressive because you've got guys on there like George Hincapi, um, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, former pro athletes and also people from, from the business. So 
How do you see that as, uh, I mean, how, to what extent is that an important part of your business model? This, not just, I guess, selling coffee in rooms, but also getting that engagement from people who keep coming back to your site. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of things actually to, to, uh, to put in a nutshell, I think, how you say it. But uh, um, for sure, like, I mean, you hear it all the time, like content is key, but also offering value to people is key for a business. I mean, it's really many things that come together. Um, the biggest motivation for me really was like to kind of escape from the corporate life and for in some way, like, uh, you know, create some kind of, balance and freedom in having something you like that it generates enough income that you can reinvest in, and so on. Yeah. So I really like push really hard, like for two, three years until now, actually to, uh, to kind of make it work. And, um, I understood that first of all, like bringing value to people is super important and, um, really like switching your mind instead of thinking what's in for me is like thinking what's, what's for them, you know, what's for the people, what yeah. can I do so that people, uh, you know, see value in what we create and have a reason to come. And yeah, that, that for some reason, I really like uh, when I, when I, I've pr probably heard it like a thousand times, uh, other entrepreneurs saying it. So it, at a time, like, you know, uh, made sense. And I started doing that. And uh, one of the good examples is like the GPX routes we have on our, on our website. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people come to the area, they don't really know where to go. And, um, you know, on our website, they can choose like a category like road or gravel. Or, or, or what is it, um, mountain biking. And yeah. we offer all tons of like routes they can do in the region. So they download it and they go for a ride and then they can shower with us. They can uh, have a drink or um, do a bike wash afterwards. Just that idea, I mean, gives a reason for people to come. I mean, you, you offer them really something of value. They can have a free shower, that's great. You know, all these things help. And then um, why doing a podcast, for example, again, you know, it's, um, it's creating value for people like, if I had to listen to some type of content, uh, it would interest me. Uh, I think it would interest a lot of people like you're doing as well. So yeah. it's a, it's a way of, uh, you know, catching attention of people and, and, um, generating traffic to our website as well, obviously, uh, yeah. which at the end funnels into a, a few, few different things. The apparel is, is one thing, but also the location and yeah. 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 No, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, you mentioned the the uh, GPX routes, um, and again, for me, you know, visiting the region. Although I was not staying at your hotel because you were uh, closed that week because of uh, still the COVID restrictions. Yeah. However, um, you know, I, again, I, I you know, I was constantly going back to your site actually to download the routes for my ride. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, all of those routes started at the front door uh, of your your cafe and hotel. So I I was visiting almost every day, even though at that time um, your doors weren't open. Um, the, the other aspect of this, I guess, is that, you know, you've become an entrepreneur. Um, the coffee ride is, is absolutely thriving. Um, but you have had this single-minded focus because, you know, there are probably thousands of bed and breakfasts and hotels in the Ardennes. However, you know, when I was doing my search and comparison, you seem to have something really unique because it's, in a way, 100% focused on cyclists. Mm -hmm. it, to what extent do you think that is something which we will see more of, we will see evolving, that that because of this boom in cycling, that more people will start to understand that you can have that kind of 100% yeah. focus? Yeah, for sure. When we started, that wasn't totally like something we were sure of. So at the first like three, four months of the business, we also had like, um, I don't know, motor guys stopping by, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's something that grew and once you notice that your whole location is filled with cyclists all year uh, or that it moves from 20 percent to 80 or 90 percent of your customer base are cyclists then you know okay it's uh the market is big is big enough and there are enough cyclists to do to do so which is yeah super nice when uh the the people you are aiming for that they come and uh, that they fill up the space needed to make it work mm -hmm. so um which is the case and um it's just awesome yeah what can yeah. i say it's uh but it's something that grew and um but for sure like the market in cycling grew the i believe that the, there's many opportunities for people to do something creative in cycling doesn't matter what so yeah what, what else to ask it's uh, it's great yeah cool cool now that's one of the things uh you know you've shared images um of 
the cotton the coffee ride when it's packed with with people and you know when you look at those images it's it's more like a clubhouse than a than a cafe or a hotel because there seems mm. to be that real community uh built around it you know and can you talk to us a little bit about you know you did spend many years competing as an athlete you you raced at the pro level um what what skills or lessons or abilities do you think that you've been able to bring from that world of being a pro athlete into now being an entrepreneur yeah like definitely to push to push through so you know at times it, it becomes hard it hurts you know it's not always like a, it's not it's not always fun in a way to do the job or to make it happen i always say like you know uh, owning a restaurant is not the same as sitting at the restaurant so uh, same here i mean from the outside it, it may look like a great which is I, I i believe so a great place to go to but at the other side doing the job or make it work or organizing it is totally different thing so you really have to like also you know what they say all the time like love the process and and love doing it that's super important but um for sure what i i, I got from cycling is to push through like to yeah to just keep pushing and at some point you know you get through it and you you evolve or you grow or you, you become stronger um that's one thing i can think of um there are probably a few others as well um yeah yeah so, now that makes a lot of sense and i think we that's a you know we've, we've spoken to many ex-rider entrepreneurs on on tcl yeah. and i think this this uh, thing that you mentioned about you know setting yourself a goal and then really pushing towards you know it. What? And I think about that. one thing is 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 that um, related to pushing through is um, you know you may think like you know I don't have time to start something or, or something like that and they always talk about a side hustle which is a, a good way to start uh, something you know you have your job and at the side you have some time but I I was actually surprised I wouldn't I'm not doing it now anymore because I I could like quit my job and do this full time so again you balance again but for like one year I combined working full-time as a brand manager and launching this in the weekends and I probably was working more than 100 hours a week for for at least a year you know doing my full-time job and then doing this next to it but it's actually impressive if you think about how much time you actually have in a week uh if you work late and you know you skip a little bit sleep is important but you can instead of sleeping nine hours you can also sleep six it, will, it still works um or instead of watching TV, you work in the evening. And if it's something you want to do for yourself or that it's an escape uh, to make a, a better future, I think it's really, uh, you, you would like be impressed of how much you can actually uh, accomplish in those extra hours. Uh, if it's something you're motivated about, it, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. yeah, no, I absolutely understand. Absolutely understand. I mean, this journey for me and and uh, the the crew in setting up TCL, it hasn't been like work. I mean, we get to speak to fascinating people like you mm. and so many people in the business, riders, you know, DSs, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a different kind of work, um, but it's yeah. work. It's work all the same. And um, you know, when you, I mean, you mentioned also leaving the corporate life and and that the decision to set up La Coffee Ride was was about. You know a dream for you related to your passion but you also mentioned lifestyle um you look in pretty good shape so i mean are you still finding time for riding your bike i mean when when i passed the cafe last week and, and we met by accident actually yeah. um you've been out on a bike ride so to what extent are you still able to ride your bike yourself and also you have a, a young child now so how how is that shift now taking place yeah i, I would say like the the first year i ride less like when we started it was really like the priority was to make it work to start so for sure there uh, i was less fit let's say and then the second year uh, i started to work three times uh three day three days a week sorry for the company mm -hmm. uh at look bikes and then the, the other time in the coffee rides so already find a better balance we didn't have a child at that time so there was some time to ride and then last year uh, we had a daughter and um again so it for sure takes some time but I don't have uh, any like uh, racing ambition or you know big ambitions on the bike. I really love to ride to kind of stay in shape and do some nice exploration rides, which I love um, doing some gravel and so on. So I'm doing like eight hours a week at the moment. If I can mm -hmm. move it up to ten or twelve, having some peak weeks during uh, spring and summer when the weather is better, I for sure want to do it. It's just so fun to get in shape and to feel the power coming back in the legs and. Just going for like six seven hours uh, in the summer and just the feeling when you after five hours when you stop at a you know a little pump station and you need some coke you already feel all the endorphins 
running in your body. I just love that feeling. And absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes why we ride, really. Yeah. Like I mean, for sure we we because a lot of time it's it's it also sucks in a way. Like <laughs> yesterday, I went for a ride in the evening, and I, it was just shit weather and cold and windy, and and I went for one hour thirty and. During one hour, I, I felt like, hey, what am, what am I doing? But you get through it and then you feel good. And I don't know, I, it's just also a habit. You know, I, I have to do like at least three three days a week some sport. Otherwise, I, yeah. I don't feel nice. No, but it makes a lot of sense, you know, and that's very much, you know, my field is, you know, leadership and entrepreneurship, but, but also more and more into the field of neuroscience and, you know, this connection between mind and body. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I've experienced also as an entrepreneur um, is that, you know, many of my best ideas actually come when I'm out on my bike. So yeah. to what extent is that true for you? I mean, when you're out on your bike, to what mm -hmm. extent are you thinking about La Coffee Ride and your plans yeah. and strategies for the future? Like all the time, you know, mm. it's a bit crazy sometimes. Sometimes I, I think like, hey, uh, am I not forgetting something? You know, isn't there something else I should, you know, look at instead of being all the time in my bubble and the things I like? But at the other hand, you know, if you're happy and if that's what you like, it's good. And uh, for sure, when you go out for a ride, uh, yeah, you, you know, you you just actually sometimes it feels more like yoga because I think it also switch off your mind mm. uh, for some some time as well, which is good. Just think about nothing, just paddle, and that that's important as well, you know, to stop thinking uh, at some times because otherwise you just yeah become crazy a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely makes sense. And yeah. and you where do you see uh, the coffee ride in maybe two three years from now? I mean, how, how do you mm -hmm. see yourself evolving the business? Obviously, you know your apparel um, is is doing very very well. Um, is it going to be more focused there, or what's your vision for the next two to three years? Yeah, well, um, the yeah, so it's three years now we are in the business, and uh, we started the apparel two years ago. And there was already, like I said, you know, in the mind map we did at the beginning, uh, one of the key ideas, but it, you know, it was one thing after the other. And um, then I realized really like, okay, what do I want? And um, the cafe is super nice. I mean, it's a great place. People come together. I, I really love that. But uh, yeah, my biggest personal drive is branding. You know, I want to want to create a brand, that, which we do and uh, grow that. So the focus, I mean, people would probably have noticed, like it's really like we want to be uh, known in the future, like really like a respected apparel brand. We'll see how how big it will get. It's not really that important how big it gets actually, but uh, I mean, being sustainable and offering good stuff is already great, which I think we do. And uh, so really like try to to grow that, expand the range, get um, more products, better products. Um, and then yeah keep growing and building on that and then um also like um you know reinvest in the in the accommodate sorry in the accommodation and the, and the cafe you know try to make it better uh, offer better services really like consolidate and build on that and then i think we'll see you know um i think i mean it's it's growing so fast that um i have no idea where we'll be in two years or three years uh but i think in two or three years it will probably be a good time to probably like have a good thought about okay what's next now because um, I expect to have some possibilities to maybe expand in a way or another but mm -hmm. the most important thing will be also at the end for me to like the process of what would be next you know yeah. uh, because the the opportunity to do bigger or more is there for sure but you have to want to do that as well and uh, like what what's gonna bring doing that so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see that at that time but for now like really focus on growing the apparel in any way and uh and consolidating the the base camp there i'm sure there are some things we can improve still so uh, we'll work on that excellent now it's wonderful to hear you talk Jeroen, because i think a lot of people uh who talk about entrepreneurship um you know they tend to focus on you know creating some some idea or business that's gonna be scalable and be global and yeah. you know, that you're gonna sort of develop into some sort of ipo and mm -hmm. however you know, very interesting hearing you speak because I would probably term someone like you more of a lifepreneur than the entrepreneur yeah. in the way we've normally thought about it. Because actually yeah. what you talked about is that for you, it seems that entrepreneurship is simply a way to enable you 
to live your life in in the way that you really want to live it <laughs> you know totally true um, like 100%. So that's, that's great to hear yeah, what, yeah what's, no, what's, would... what's your take on that this idea of entrepreneurship yeah. versus lifepreneurship I actually never heard the lifepreneurship, so I'll, I'll, I, I'll, I made it up. I actually just made uh, it up. I, I've been talking about it for a little while now, but yeah, yeah. That, that's one of mine. But you probably never heard of it. Mm. No, but um, yeah, what's my take on that? What you said, I mean, that's really key. Um, you know, the, the there are hundred opportunities in in any form, and that's not a reason to do them. You really have to like be sure that what it gets you into that's something you will enjoy. I mean, how can you bring anything good to anybody if you if you're unhappy? So I think that's a logical thing to to focus on. First of all, like you know, being in a place where you feel good, and then try to to do good stuff. And I think that's uh, already a good thing. I mean, it will it will bring joy and happiness. So, I mean, that's for sure important. But um, yeah, I would also would like to share for people. You know, it's not a. I mean, there are hundreds of ways to find happiness, and uh, I think it's often much more close to us than we think. And uh, sometimes it could be a bit scary. I mean, there's so much around, you know, building a business that I don't want people to think like everybody should build a business. I mean, that's so not true at all. And there's nothing wrong with working corporate or having a job uh, in a corporate world. Uh, I think the most important thing is to find a, the right balance that fits you. And uh, I mean, you can have like a job with great colleagues and working on interesting projects, which is totally cool. I mean. I don't want to think that I don't want people to think like it's only cool if you and if you build a business or if you're an entrepreneur that's so so not true but for sure for me it's really about um you know um uh, finding for me I wasn't happy in what I was doing uh, so I I had to find some other way and just trying to build something uh, on which I can uh, build my own life around and if I can offer value doing so to people and you know building something nice that's that's great that's all i'm looking for so now i'm just like trying to kind of still have some for sure ambition you know that's in my body mm. but uh find a balance between uh growing ambition uh a bit of competition and then also like uh just you know enjoying riding bike doing fun stuff with my friends just enjoying being here on earth and you know yeah. enjoying but the little things i guess when i listen to you speak and uh i'm sure that's inspiring for a lot of people but you know the other thing i think is that you know you are a little bit special in that you had the courage to do it you know i think there's a lot of people in corporate roles i mean you mentioned that you know often in the corporate job it is comfortable you know you get the company car you get the nice paycheck every month of yeah. course you have to work and you often have to work hard yeah um but when you step out to being an entrepreneur you know the only invoices that are coming in each month are the ones that you are driving and generating it's it's a very different sort of take and you know a lot of people are afraid of risk or uncertainty so what advice would you give to people who maybe have a dream have have an aspiration to yeah. try something on their own but are feeling held back by in a way that some people call golden cage or safety of what they have right now yeah you don't want to be delusional so for sure i wouldn't say like jump you know just jump because it's good to have a little bit of you know thoughts about what you're doing but then the other thing is also like to just, you know, I mean, what Nike says, just do it, you know, like you have to start. And I started and I, I probably made the bit, biggest mistake at that time, um, starting with somebody, which didn't work out. So uh, after three weeks, we already like find an arrangement to stop. But uh, I actually lived the, the worst four weeks of my life at that time. But uh, the, the reason it happened, that mistake is because I, uh, at some point, six months before starting uh, Le Coffee Ride, I thought, okay, I should stop thinking or hearing myself think, uh, you know, name all the reasons why not to and just start. And that's what I did. Luckily, I, I, I went through it. Uh, and at the end, you know, it, it brings us here. So probably the, you know, at some point you just have to just start doing something. I remember my wife told me like, you know, I was like moaning again, being like, oh, I don't know what to do. What should I do? This and that. And she just said, I just start a freaking website and just, just do something, you know, just start. <laughs> so, so that, that's for sure. Like uh, one of one advice I would give, like, uh, like I said, there's so much time uh, as a side also, you can do so much, uh, even in the evening hours and also cons consistency, like don't look at what you can do in one day, but you know, count the, the hours you can do in a year if you do three hours a day and, uh, yeah. give it time and then it will, it will grow. And also like, um, don't don't worry about what people think you know 
so it doesn't matter what people think like even if you look stupid at first i have a, a lot of respect sometimes you know you see somebody starting something and, and you think like oh it looks a bit stupid but you know i have a lot of respect because yeah nobody starts being perfect in anything you have to like you know do a whole process to to reach something so you know just do your thing and um yeah don't don't listen to people who judge or whatever the yeah 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 now that's that's a great comment and i and especially so i mean uh you know being here in belgium uh you know i've been here for 10 years and actually that's something that struck me that you know entrepreneurialism um i think still in belgium is seen as something which is a bit weird or a bit risky mm. or and you know when you do start talking to people about launching entrepreneurial ventures um here you know the, the usual things you say people tell you is there's a lot of risk and you know there's uncertainty and you could fail and that's very different to where i come from australia which is kind of like yeah. you know if you if you haven't kind of tried to be an entrepreneur by the time you're in your 40s people kind of look at you like you haven't really tried hard enough right hmm. um and that is also about failure because you know one thing that i guess i understood when i went independent when i was 40 years old was that you know i've still got like at least 25 maybe 30 years of work ahead of me mm -hmm. so even if i try this and it doesn't work out well you know what you know if i take two or three years to give it a try i can always go back you know i can always step that's back so into true. a job or a corporate mm -hmm. role you know um and again i think that's something which maybe i don't know was that something that you reflected upon that you're still a rather you're, you're still a young guy mm -hmm. so you still got time you know was that conscious in your mind or was that something maybe you've reflected upon later no no not no. really actually but one thing i noticed is that at the end you're much more in control when uh you know you are your own boss than if you work for somebody so it's a bit like a paradox but you would think otherwise working for a company get your paycheck uh you know how to play the game you know you're secure but I mean, actually, you're not, you know, you're not in control at all. If somebody decides that the whole project, the company you're working on has to be canceled for some financial reason or otherwise, you're just gone, you know. And uh, if you are your own boss, at the end, I noticed, I realized that, hey, I'm actually totally in control here. So I actually feel much more secure now, um, which is great. Yeah. Great, good stuff. Well, you've already been great to meet you. I mean, as a, and I have to say that, I mean, personally, um, what you've done has been a great inspiration for me. Um, as mm -hmm. you know, you know, I've recently acquired yeah. uh, a small hotel uh, in the Flemish Ardennes, and we're, we're really going to develop that, develop that into a, a community and a clubhouse and a place for people who are passionate about cycling, but also for people who are passionate about entrepreneurship. Um, so this conversation for me has been really inspiring. I think it's going to be really inspiring um, for those people who are watching um, as well. So, um, Jeroen, thank you very much for your time today. And I yeah. think from everyone in the uh, TCL, the Cycling Life community, we wish you every success for the future of Le Coffee Ride. Thanks, Jeroen. Thanks, James.